Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of No Fear Project, we are proud and honored to be part of the European Forum on Disaster Risk Reduction 2021. My name is Chaim Wafalowski. I'm a disaster management person. For the last, in my organization, they will tell you 500 years, I've been telling my colleagues that one day we will have a large scale pandemic. If you want to put it in official terms, it is on our contingency plan. Our contingency plans say one day we will have a pandemic. And then I will fly back in time to end of December 2019, where some rumors about something going on in China started uh, going through. And then we had January, and in February, hell broke loose. Stories about people dying on the streets in China, um, something about the pandemic, which is global, going on everywhere. Um, first cases in Israel coming from the Diamond Princess a boat in uh, Asia. And we had to start preparing and found ourselves with cases and with an outbreak in Israel, like all the colleagues around the globe in the healthcare sector. And we really didn't know where to go to. It was something new, something really scary, something we didn't have answers for many of the questions our colleagues asked us. And this is the moment we all turn to our strong network, the strong network of No Fear Project that really helped us better prepare and better respond to this great challenge, which is not over, is still going on. So today we are going to talk about international cooperation in the midst of a global pandemic. We are honored to have with us a very distinguished list of speakers. And without uh, further ado, I would hand over to the No Fear Project Coordinator, Professor Francesco de la Corte from Primedi. Professor de la Corte, please. Uh, coordinator of the No Fear Project. No fear means a network of practitioners for emergency medical systems and critical care. Is, uh, in my figure, I am the responsible of the emergency department of my university hospital that is uh, called um, Novara, a uh, site in Novara, very close to in the, between in Milan and Turin. And uh, we were uh, at the very beginning of the COVID uh, pandemia, we were the first hit. Uh, by, by the pandemic, because uh, we were very close to Lombardy, that was the site, the region where the uh, pandemic started. Um, I am also the director of uh, CREMEDIM, that is a center of research of uh, emergency and disaster medicine. The, our project uh, have, is a, uh, built up with the consortium of uh, 18 partners as a duration of five years. Uh, in the, the last two years, uh, the last third of the program is uh, starting now as it's going on. Uh, it's a uh, no fear project objectives are that to bring together a pan European and beyond network of practitioners, suppliers, researchers, and policymakers. We all together to try to meet the goal or to achieve a common understanding of needs and priorities to fill operational gaps and to pinpoint areas for future research. So here is the, uh, uh, the uh, mention of uh, uh, all the people who are involved in, uh, we are covering quite all the surface of uh, Europe and we have also a um, uh, connection uh, worldwide with a lot of people we became um, higher in number after the um, uh, outbreak of, uh, um, of the COVID pandemic. So our uh, network uh, works on three main pillars. Uh, one is the acute care of the patient in, uh, in emergency and disaster situation, 
operation uh, in security related uh, incidents and training and education of personnel and volunteers. These three main pillars are tied together transversely with uh, two other topics that are concerning ethical, human, and social and legal issues, and also innov innovation monitoring and the uptake plan just to give the participants, especially uh, practitioners and academics, the possibility to get in contact with uh, people uh, delivering uh, this um, uh, new newsness in, in the field of, uh, uh, of the pre-hospital care. So the project structure is uh, based on uh, this uh, cycle, uh, starting from uh, the debate about uh, lesson learned needs, trends with a focus on new threats, even if to be sincere, at the very beginning in 1988, we didn't thought that we had passed most of our time on pandemias. That was uh, something that uh, came, up, came up from, from the blue. And uh, it, it took, as we will see in a few slides, in the next slides, uh, quite all the time that we are um, dealing, we are dealt with. So uh, after this uh, discussion on uh, lesson learned needs and trends, we uh, try to uh, extract current and um, future innovative solutions to give uh, feedbacks on this uh, possible solution uh, and a recommendation from practitioners and suppliers and to exhibit and to work upon and to discuss all these uh, uh, feedbacks and recommendations during workshop and exercise and demonstration. So to give the flavor that uh, something could be uh, shared together to uh, make it uh, a, a something that could be useful for the whole world of uh, emergency medicine. So uh, we had tools through, what, through which we uh, had the possibility to, to work upon the, these, uh, these objectives. One was a transactional dynamic portal that has been established by the University of Nice and that is managed uh, also uh, all together by us, that was uh, the possibility to publish on that uh, portal all the catalogs that uh, we can change uh, going on, on the, with the project. So it's a dynamic catalog uh, to report uh, the lesson learned and gaps that we um, uh, look at. Uh, we had also thematic foray and library uh, to improve our knowledge. And uh, every two months, uh, we had a, a project event that uh, in different cases were workshops, showcases, debates, and full-scale exercise. Uh, we started with a kickoff in uh, Novara, and after that, um, we moved to um, Madrid, and after that, uh, to Nice, sorry, for a foresight exercise, and then to Madrid, and then to Rome, and then uh, to uh, Tel Aviv. That was uh, the last opportunity to meet together, uh, not in person. So it was a very exciting exercise. Uh, but unfortunately, after that meeting, it was not possible any longer to have uh, a, a meeting in person. And we hope to have the next one in, uh, in Oslo in the uh, coming month, in November more specifically. So uh, to monitor our research and innovation and uh, to analyze and recommend, it, and recommend the uptakes, we have different, uh, different uh, ways. We establish an innovation watch uh, that is uh, uh, running every uh, twice a year. And, uh, and having also the opportunity to monitoring other EU, EU projects and also to make together the possibility to work for funding opportunities. Uh, we had also market analysis, uh, business models, uh, business supports. And also another point that uh, was a focus in our project was standardization. That is something that in some parts of emergency medicine is still lacking. So uh, just to make a, a, a brief uh, reminder to the, the, our actions in the, in the last year, uh, we had, as I told you before, a workshop on uh, hospital preparedness and security in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, when, as uh, uh, Hein said us, uh, we had uh, the first COVID-19 case reported in the European Union. And uh, 
in uh, just after the first meeting with our project manager that was held in Brussels. And uh, after that, the pandemia uh, hit our, uh, our program as it hit our hospitals and our universities. In uh, March 11, uh, 2020, I remember that uh, the Director General of uh, uh, the World Health Organization declared that COVID-19 was a global pandemic. So we reacted to this uh, unfortunate situation, trying to move our specific competence at the time as they were scheduled in, uh, in the beginning to uh, the COVID pandemic. And we start uh, to try to get uh, supply and to serve ourselves to implement the response of others uh, being the first who had this bad experience in Europe. We are organizing a lot of uh, seminars, specifically on topics that were of the greatest interest for all the people who would li have liked to be involved in this strategy. So you see that uh, at the moment uh, here, uh, there are quite 20 seminars that we have uh, proposed to during these uh, last uh, 18 months. And this, uh, we pick up the titles and we, uh, in, in the, the very uh, is the problems that we had to face during the pandemic, and uh, we try to share the contents uh, most internationally as possible. Uh, we had participation, uh, I, 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 I think that we can uh, say it without any doubts, that we put together so many practitioners, so many important institutions, so many academic centers that they gave us the opportunity to have a great changes of competencies and uh, projects and uh, solutions. And this was very, very uh, important to us. You see that um, the content of these webinars was so different um, in, in, in the perspective, but also in the same time, they were looking to make the figure the more complete as possible, you know. Uh, and uh, sometimes we have a suggestion by our group of, uh, uh, of people in uh, the Nofier, but sometimes we got from uh, uh, people participating to our webinars the suggestion for more and more implementation of webinars contents. So this is, was a very, very, very great interaction between us and, uh, and the other groups. So uh, in, uh, when the, uh, the pandemic started, we decided to change our life. And uh, the, this webinar series, as I tried to summarize before, were aiming to involving uh, a, a strongly existing global network of practitioners uh, involved uh, first hand in the COVID-19 response, also by creating opportunities for quick and dirty exchanges of information, practices, lesson learned, just to have immediate responses to which we had to face in, at that time. Uh, we try also to explore how different countries responded to the same challenges in different stages of the pandemic. And this was very, very, very important, a very, very good exchange of information. Also, we were investigating the availability of new developed tools or services for the COVID-19 response. So if I have to answer these questions, why we agreed to share in the middle of the network? I think that there were different changes, different, different times. At the very beginning, the situation was uh, exploding like a bomb that we were not expecting it. Uh, and so at the very beginning, we had a lack of knowledge of clinical and therapeutic aspects uh, that uh, the SARS-CoV-19 and their effect on patients. I remember those bad times that we were not informed at all. And the first pathophysiological studies were coming out. But at the very beginning, it was very difficult to face these patients. Uh, another point that was uh, very important at the beginning was the personal protection devices and also the general and specific risk protection inside the hospital, but also outside the hospital. The organization, a reorganization of all the structure that were uh, uh, accepting patients, the creation of few areas where new intensive care 
expand, uh, we had to expand our emergency department. We had to change our attitude to, to, to treat these patients. So it was a big mess. And also the need to, to share contacts among different specialists um, to anticipate possible problems that were at that time unknown in the local settings. Uh, we, and after that, we have to move uh, to another point that was the impact on emergency public health. Uh, to consider that this has, uh, had become at that time a disaster. So the, uh, either the, the, the um, uh, emergency public health and also the uh, ethical aspects that were correlated to the pandemia it came up and they were very difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to tackle. So it was a very bad time you know, at the beginning. And uh, among the waves, because uh, we in Italy, we had uh, four uh, waves, the first very, very impacting on uh, the emergency departments and, uh, and the intensive care, the second that was mostly on the emergency um, uh, department and on the uh, on the um, on the wards, especially um, infectious disease wards and uh, um, internal internal medicine wards. And after that, the third one was uh, decreasing uh, in uh, in power, but uh, uh, it was always a problem, mainly related to to internal medicine departments and infectious disease departments. Why the fourth one, at least in Italy, in a, in a, in, in a reversal way uh, of the, uh, the previous were uh, uh, due to the fact that vaccines started to work. We, it was very uh, less in power, uh, but the games in different countries of probably not have a very different need for response. Another problem came from the new variants. In the beginning it was uh, uh, alpha and then beta and now it's delta. So every Specific uh, pandemias had different uh, different problems, and uh, we had also the so-called uh, infodemia uh, uh, communication to the public that was uh, not always managed in a, in a, in the good way. You know, there was a confusion, overlapping uh, uh, narcissism, and so on that gave us a a, a, a bad time to uh, re respond to some of the patient issues. Uh, we started to have social restrictions, you know, the uh, quarantine, the obligation to have the green pass as we had in Italy, the due of people to, uh, to be vaccinated. And, uh, and now, and in the last months, uh, and especially now, we had some way of reacting by people that were very, 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 very strong, you know. And so this is a, 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 a problem that now is... Uh, quite more important than uh, the than, uh, uh, pandemic itself. And also disparities, you know, the, the evolution of uh, this pandemic in different parts of the world. And the uh, new debate is coming if uh, we need to uh, vaccinate people, to renounce to vaccinate to the third dose vaccine, to give these vaccines to other people in the world. And also the, 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 the vaccine and the, the new therapies that are coming. So. It's a, it, it's a, it was a huge problem and also a, a malignant problem, a problem because it's going to change every, uh, every uh, way and uh, independently also of that. Uh, but there were some appealing findings that we, that we uh, had during that discussion. Silent hypoxia, disinfection protocols, reuse of uh, PPE, telemedicine, supply chain challenges, psychosocial issues, uh, use of convalescent, uh, convalescent uh, um, plasma, the ventilation techniques, nursing homes, uh, correlated lungs, ultrasonography scores, so, and COVID in children. So these were the most appealing that we had to our discussion, but I think that they were very important point to our uh, project. Uh, we uh, had this uh, agreement and this uh, work, uh, interactive work, also to improve uh, the dissemination through some studies that uh, we have done uh, during, uh, during this time. There's our uh, uh, publication, uh, improved collaboration and networking, and also some uh, interesting report 
that have been uh, uh, um, given, uploaded in our website. So uh, I finished my presentation. I hope to have uh, given you a, an overview of our project. And uh, of course, we would like to give response and uh, to be absolutely open to possible collaboration that could be proposed by anybody of you who could uh, uh, give us the opportunity for a new networks for the present and for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Um, and I will go directly to the practitioner's experience. So Paloma, on behalf of uh, Samut Protection Civil Madrid, please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon to all, and thank you for calling me for, for this interesting <laughs> webinar. And um, we have uh, participated almost in, in 20 webinars uh, along the, the COVID pandemic. And there have been medical aspects, there have been uh, logistical training, everything. But uh, in medical aspects, we, we participate uh, mainly in ultrasound, pediatric, uh, the new waves, and the lessons identified on, on ventilation techniques. But uh, the real thing is that the only one, uh, uh, the one of the ventilation techniques from the hospital setting was made during the first wave. The rest of them uh, were discussed uh, when the worst uh, wave had passed. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, sorry, Haim. Um, the logistic aspects uh, with the new disinfection technologies and supply challenge, and the, of course the training aspects uh, were treated when the emergency wave had passed, the, the first uh, important wave. But uh, I think it was uh, really great to delay them because uh, we wouldn't have enough, uh, have had enough experience about this uh, to analyze and to learn from them. So, so all this, uh, I think all these factors uh, need to be seen um, along the time, comparing, uh, learning, and and learning from from the others. So it was logical to, to put them aside for, for a moment. And, and this one, the operational aspects, uh, as you see, there were lots of them. And, and more than half of these webinars were done during the first wave. And uh, were mainly of measures, experience, uh, care of, of team members, um, I mean, they were not specifically medical aspects, but uh, more operational aspects in a moment where, where a global impact of, of an unknown disease was causing so many deaths and we were like, uh, like in shock. So we had to, to learn one from each other. Uh, the other ones uh, were at the second half of the year and mainly treated from uh, lessons learned um, from the first way, uh, like uh, how we manage the, the, the human researches, how we made with the EMS operation, how we change, how we change the training. And, and this made us to analyze uh, uh, this in a realistic way, why we had all seen. And I think it was very useful in, in the next waves. This is just a, a timeline of, of how we manage this next one. And the lessons we learned, uh, uh, mainly there are lots, lots, lots of lessons learned, uh, but uh, the, the one we can take uh, is first uh, regarding to the EMS, we have to adapt uh, our scenarios, our transportation, our collaboration, our facilities, our uh, converting our EMS system uh, in a COVID EMS system. Uh, second of it, um, uh, talking about the workers, how did we have to uh, take care of them? How did we have to to make some briefings every day to clarify, to, 
to make them feel safe, uh, training the PPEs, um, making them to feel safe, any question they did have. And then we did have our problem with the medical supplies, a, a lack of stock, a stocks that were not um, certified, but we didn't know at that time. So the, the, all that we, we could learn. And of course, it, it put their later waves, but it's not the reality it's from the beginning. Maybe we missed um, taking care of the emergency call uh, workers because we all in the pandemic, we were in contact. Oh, we are heroes. But sometimes we forget about the those who are taking care, taking the calls, mm, trying to calm the, the people. And they did a fantastic job and we could learn it in the lessons learned of the emergency medical uh, call centers. So we have to say that. And uh, we shared uh, knowledge, uh, one from each other to um, practice learning tools, preparedness, uh, uh, addressing the, the, the analysis, the quarantine, the, the everything. But unfortunately, I, I think we will still have many issues to, to study from now on and to take care of, of them because uh, the post-COVID symptoms, the long COVID illness, it's not very um, studied yet. And of course, the psychosocial support of uh, healthcare workers and, and populations in general. Let's see how this uh, pandemic um, goes. So we will have to have much more uh, webinars, hopefully. So in conclusion, uh, we think that the global lockdown uh, forced uh, our organization to adopt and to adapt to new ways of working and training. That's very important. Uh, as the pandemic was spreading around the world, the, we have a lot of demand of information of, on practice, on how could we do, how could we protect. Uh, res and response measures uh, became very, very important. Uh, of course, the sharing of knowledge, the learning tools, the experience, the best practices among professionals by these webinars has proved to be critical. And the share information, uh, we should uh, have it as a new public good. And as Voltaire said, is there anyone so wise as to learn by the experience of other? I think we are doing. And I uh, really think that if you see something is uh, working, just copy it. And that's what we have done with many, many webinars we have participated in. And that's all I can say. Aloma, thank you very much. Uh, I think that, yes, the idea that we still have a long way to go is, is a major uh, thing and we should leverage on the strength of our network. So thank you so much also for taking the time in the midst of the nightmare to share with all of us. Thank you. Susan, please go ahead. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Kaim, and thank you everyone for accommodating my request. I'm sorry to join late. Uh, I was in the middle of a meeting in Tanzania, but I will go straight to uh, my presentation. Uh, my name is Susan Ngonga. I'm the managing director for uh, EPLUS, which is Emergency Medical Service for the Kenya Red Cross. And I'm happy to have this opportunity to share our experiences of the COVID-19 uh, operation in Kenya. So EPLUS today is uh, the largest priv private emergency pre-hospital care medical provider in Eastern Central Africa and it is fully owned by the Kenya Red Cross. We have a, a fleet, the largest fleet that is equipped with state-of-the-art ambulances, 24-hour uh, tech savvy dispatch center, and highly uh, equipped and professional staff who work cohesively together to bring world-class pre-hospital care to those we serve. As I said, we are fully owned by the Kenya Red Cross, 
and we offer our services on a commercial basis and on corporate social responsibility in support of the mission of Kenya Red Cross of alleviating human suffering. We operate two ambulances uh, in the form of basic life support and advanced cardiac life support to international standards. So since the coronavirus pandemic in 2019, the Ministry of Health has stepped up preventive and mitigation initiatives, uh, such as mass vaccination program to curb the spread and death of this uh, outbreak. To date, we have over 250,000 uh, COVID-19 cases that have been confirmed in Kenya, uh, with 4 million being fully vaccinated. Uh, certain measures were undertaken by the Ministry of Health, which include nationwide daily curfew from 10 p.m. to 4, 4 a.m. There was ban on social gatherings, which continued to run till the 4th of November, 2021. Mask vaccination program is continuing, and we are also receiving a lot of vaccination uh, from our partners, uh, Public sensitization campaigns on the importance of washing hands with soap and water, use of sanitizers, social distancing and wearing of face masks, capacity building of county health providers on contact tracing, rapid response and use of data management teams. So some of the main activities undertaken by EPLAS included sharing experiences and addressing challenges through peer-to-peer -peer discussion and continuous medical education. Uh, we also ensured that the staff were equipped with proper PPEs and continuous training on donning and doffing procedures. Maximum reduction of risk to personnel by practicing high level of infection prevention and control measures and strict monitoring to ensure compliance. We had daily debriefings and psychosocial support to the staff and prompt response to emerging issues. We participated in webinars and finding relevant fact-based fa fact training for our staff to equip them with adequate information on COVID-19. We also worked closely with the Ministry of Health to evacuate suspected and confirmed cases. Uh, and we were the only provider that had the capacity to handle uh, these COVID cases on behalf of Ministry of Health. We did contact tracing and movement of identified contacts to quarantine areas. We supported screening in some counties and participated in sensitization and awareness creation in the community. Aid as response, uh, rapid response teams in sample collections and transfer to laboratories for testing. We also had real-time data capture and sharing of national trend monitoring. We did continuous testing of staff, uh, which was vital in guaranteeing the highest standards of safety. Uh, preparedness was a multifunctional effort to ensure smooth running of evacuations and transfers. Increased demand for adequate supply of personal protective gear for all frontliners was very important as part of the lessons that we learned. High demand for psychosocial support for the ambulance crew due to the uncertainty and misinformation from stigma. Continuous daily briefings facilitated timely address of key issues of concerns for smooth operations. And continuous motiv motivation to the staff during the pandemic was a very key lesson for us. Group therapy support for staff affected by the pandemic was equally very important. And we had WhatsApp support groups created that uh, members could socialize and share their experiences. On areas to improve, uh, we noticed that uh, there was lack of preparedness of other partners, and this was important, uh, government and private institutions to prepare adequately for smooth process to receive patients infected with the virus. Uh, this would enhance uh, our handover processes. Uh, close collaboration and coordination of activities together with all stakeholders in the fight against COVID-19 is one area of uh, improvement that we noted. Adequate stocking of PPEs and prudent utilization was also very important. With the inflation of prices at the beginning of the pandemic, 
and increase of confirmed cases, there was high demand for PPEs. Frequent meetings to, to monitor trends and respond to emerging issues, and also improve preparedness of facilities and equipment required for case management. Uh, there was need also for improved workforce mobilization and adequate preparation of response. So international knowledge sharing was very important uh, for us. And uh, because this was the first time for us that we were dealing with a pandemic, uh, we found that it was very important to share knowledge internationally. And this enhanced the sharing and adoption of uh, best practices among different players. We at EPLUS learned a lot from our collaboration, especially with the Magen David Adom in Israel, and also from the forums like No Fear uh, Wadem Forum. We were able also to purchase our first portable isolation chambers for evacuation and understand how the ISO acts have aided in safe evacuations of those confirmed with COVID. International knowledge sharing also helped to build synergy, collaboration and cooperation between different entities involved in dealing with the, the pandemic. So Susan, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I think that uh, the idea that uh, we had this uh, collaboration between uh, different continents yes. and, uh, gave us a unique opportunity to address different realities in, in different countries. And I hope that since you uh, were lucky to be late in, in your cases, we managed to help you to deal better than uh, our very hectic days at the very beginning of, uh, of, this, uh, of this pandemic. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we saw the uh, situation in uh, Africa, and now we will go to uh, the continent that where it all started. And uh, please, Yvonne. Yes, thank you, Kaim, and good day to everyone. Uh, so to discuss about the, the challenges and response of the Philippine Red Cross for COVID-19 pandemic, uh, just to start, uh, my name is Vaughn Ryan Ong. I'm the safety services manager. Uh, my department handles the EMS uh, services and also the training. Uh, but uh, our scope during the pandemic were extended to a different uh, support to the, to the battle or to the war for pandemic. So who, who we are or what we do? The Philippine Red Cross is a 70 years old service in, in the country. We, are, we have been an unstoppable in fulfilling our mandate as an auxiliary arm of the government uh, in fighting uh, emergency health issues, disasters, and other, other means of um, disruption to the community. Uh, through our volunteers, logistics, and information technology, the PRC has been always first always ready and always there in responding to any, uh, any events. During the pandemic, uh, as I mentioned, we handle our emergency services. Um, uh, the early stage of the pandemic, we are really in the, in the blind side or in the cloud that we cannot respond immediately. There were back and forth of the discussion between the Philippine Red Cross and our uh, our health ministry in in making sure that we can cater the responses or requests of COVID positive patient. Actually, we started uh, discussing uh, not only for emergency services but also as a whole response of the country, uh, as we are uh, the auxiliary arm to the government. Uh, focus on the emergency services uh, as of today since uh, last year when we started in March uh, our lockdowns uh, we already catered to 981 uh, patients that are COVID positive and other responses were uh, considered as uh, a possible COVID responses and as of today we already responded to uh, nearly 6,000 patients uh, for, for COVID and then COVID. This is a effort of our 103 chapters all over the country that 
are responding not only for emergency but also for the pandemic. So to to protect our uh, responders and our frontliners, uh, we created our interim guidelines for emergency medical services. These guidelines are uh, a, a like a bible for the volunteers and staff for EMS, not only for the ambulances but also for other sector in fighting against pan, uh, COVID-19. This, this interim guidelines include also the, the management of patient inside the ambulance, outside the ambulance, also managing our, our internal uh, offices in, in, our, in, uh, in our headquarters and our chapters. These guidelines also include um, media, we use uh, video-based training uh, for our volunteers and staff uh, for doning and doping for, for PPEs, uh, hand washing, alcohol, wa- uh, and, uh, alcohol rub. Uh, also, we created our training program for managing our ambulances, especially uh, our negative pressure. So to emphasize our ambulance uh, unit or ambulance support, we have 171 ambulances all over the country and six of which are negative pressure ambulance. We, we, fur- we purchased these ambulances during the early days of pandemic. So the, the lockdown started in the country uh, March 15. Then uh, fortunate enough that we have the capacity to, to import, actually export uh, the ambulance from China that give us a another layer for protection for our for our responder. Uh, actually, I usually quote this as a triple layer or a three layer protection for our responder. Uh, first, the PPE. Second is the isolation chamber, and for the ambulance itself, it's it's a it's it it's include a a negative pressure within the, the ambulance cabin. These ambulances were dis- distributed to different uh, region of the country that were being utilized for responding for COVID uh, in their local uh, chapter. Uh, to, to give emphasis also for the ambulance, we created a marketing, marketing video or a ad video that I'll be showing uh, after this slide uh, to give hope to our countrymen that we are ready to support and respond to the need for the COVID pandemic. Next, uh, our also, we also responded in the needs of testing our, our public or our community. Um, the Philippine Red Cross now have 13 uh, molecular laboratories, which are spread also in our country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the government only have one laboratory that can do testing, uh, which is very limited. That is why our chairman and our management uh, decided to go into venturing to a molecular laboratory. And now, as we speak today, uh, we already nearly tested 5 million individuals uh, for the whole country. And this relates to uh, 25% of the testing capacity or testing cap- uh, capability of the whole country. So we are a, a big support to the government in, in detecting persons or individuals who were test or who were infected by COVID-19 and make sure that we can separate uh, them from uh, other people to our uh, isolation facility, government or the Philippine Red Cross. In response for the protection also for our uh, staff and volunteer, and even for the, uh, for the community, first we prioritize our, our team, our ambulance team, our frontliners, our staff for vaccination for COVID. So uh, fortunate enough that even though we were unable to secure a large amount of vaccine from from a supplier. Uh, eventually, there were support coming from uh, from the government that we were allocated uh, certain numbers or uh, units of vaccine for us to make sure that we are protected and we can support uh, 
uh, the government throughout the, the fight against uh, COVID-19. So uh, as of today, uh, we have 319,000 uh, vaccinated individuals and we launched actually um, a vaccination buses that were spread also in the country that were going to a remote places, a uh, far flung area to reach the unserved uh, people under the vaccination program of the, of the country. And also we created uh, and partner uh, with uh, big malls uh, shopping malls to be the venue for our vaccination uh, site. So people can just register and go to the mall and they will be vaccinated by the Philippine Red Cross. Uh, in connection to the continuous uh, support to an individual who were tested positive, so once we detected uh, an indiv individual who is infected of COVID-19, we can uh, serve them or we can uh, bring them to our isolation facility. When I say our isolation facility, this is a partnership with local government and uh, schools, private and, and public, that we converted our classrooms to a, a isolation facility. This isolation facility are intended for our asymptomatic patients. And we have 24-7 uh, uh, medical staff that can monitor the, the patient, uh, doctors, nurses, aides, and all the provision that are needed by the patient were given uh, through the support of our donors and uh, partnership with other stakeholders. So as of today, we have operational uh, five isolation facility, and we already serve 4,600 individuals. And we are creating more isolation facilities, especially uh, up north in, in, uh, in the island of Sul uh, Luzon. Uh, by this week, we will be uh, operation operational the, the six uh, isolation facilities. The isolation facility are for asymptomatic, while our emergency field hospital, uh, as you can see, uh, is for symptomatic from mild to, to severe or moderate uh, patient of COVID. And this is a partnership to our Philippine Lung Center, uh, the main uh, hospital that caters uh, for respiratory con uh, concern. Uh, the emergency field hospital are located in the compound of the hospital because we need to have a continuous uh, co coordination with a hospital and our emergency field hospital. Um, we can do upgrading them to, to the hospital uh, side, or they can also um, step down from a critical patient inside the ICU of the hospital going to our emergency field hospital. As of today, we have 51,723 individuals that are being served by our uh, medical tents or emergency field hospital. This is in support to 62 hospitals all over the country. Um, there are also efforts in providing a, a higher survival rate for COVID patients by transfusing, transfusing uh, convalescent plasma coming from a, a COVID positive recovered patient. So we have our convalescent plasma center in our old office uh, that we can uh, uh, get and, and filter the, the plasma that contains uh, certain um, antibodies going to, uh, that can be transmuted, transmission, transmuted to the uh, patient that has been uh, infected by COVID in a moderate to severe critical patient. And uh, fortunate enough that a lot of uh, recovered patients were uh, interested to help the, the uh, current uh, COVID positive patient. So we already collected uh, 1,145 units from 1,014 individuals uh, that, uh, that can support in convalescent, convalescent plasma program. Um, our conventional uh, first uh, blood donation is still ongoing, even though we 
have a decrease of the do- donor for blood because of the scare of getting out and going to the office, traveling to to the blood centers. So our our blood services uh, conducted mobile blood donation, meaning they are the ones who's going out uh, for for a group of people that would like to donate, or even getting the people uh, ferrying them from their house going to the to the um, blood center just to make sure that they can uh, donate blood and we can serve our our uh, community with enough blood supply for for their other illnesses, not only for COVID uh, related. So as of today, we already collected 242,628 units and served uh, 123,681 patients for, for these years alone. Um, because of the disruption of the uh, economic in the country, we also take uh, pride in our hot meals on wheels or we provide uh, uh, meals for, for the affected community or local barangay by serving them hot meals or, or rice toppings that uh, gives them uh, for, for their main uh, course or main, main meals for the day. And this is a continuous uh, effort until today uh, as of now, we already have like 20 plus uh, hot meals on wheel that are roving around the community just to serve uh, food for, for the most vulnerable. So we have already 100,173 beneficiary of hot meals. And along with this effort, uh, our welfare services continues to provide psychological first aid or, or counseling for our uh, community that were might be trauma, trauma tra- uh, experienced trauma in having COVID positive uh, result or are the relative are positive on COVID. Then uh, even though we with the pandemic, we also continue our dialysis center. This is the first uh, dialysis center uh, for the Philippine Red Cross. Uh, we already have like 15 seats that can cater for the patient for dialysis. And this is also in support to our uh, dialysis center of the government because uh, unfortunately, some of the hospital were uh, infected or the personnel in the hospital were infected. So some of the patient were catered by the Philippine Red Cross or extended to the emergency field hospital. As of today, we already have 13,161 patients served in our dialysis center. And to kill, to accumulate or culmination of our efforts to, to COVID-19 pandemic uh, war or battle, uh, we have a ad again, a video, video presentation to, to capture our efforts for our responses. To, to mind you, we are not only tackling uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, crisis, but also early last year, we have a volcanic eruption, multiple um, typhoons that hits different parts of the country. So the Philippine Red Cross is a really a multi-sector uh, response and support to the government. So to, to, to show some of the, uh, the summary of our uh, responses, uh, please watch our video. Thank you. Sa nagdaang labing limang buwan, sa pamamagitan ng mga walang kapagurang kawani at volunteers ng Philippine Red Cross, na ipakita natin sa buong mundo na kahit gaano kabigat ang pagsubok na dumaan sa ating bansa, basta sama-sama tayo. Together, we are unstoppable. Sa pagtutok pa lang ng taong 2020, sinalubo na tayo ng bigla ang pagsabog ng Bulkan Taal. Hinabalot ng makapal na abo ang maraming bayan. Kasama na rito ang kalakhang Maynila. Pagsapit ng buwan ng Marso, tumama sa ating bansa ang pandemya ng COVID-19. Maraming nawalan ng trabaho. Marami rin ang nagkasakit. 
isang malakas na lintol naman ang bubungad sa atin noong Agosto ng yanig ng 6.6 magnitude na lintol ang probinsya ng Bicol. Sa nakalipas na labing limang buwan, mahigit sa dalawampung bagyo ang pumasok sa ating bansa. Labing dalawa dito ang tumama sa kalupaan. Ang sunod-sunod na bagyo noong buwan ng Oktubre hanggang Nobyembre ay nagdulot ng matinding paghihirap sa ating mga mamamayan. Ang mga bagyong kinta, bagyong roli at bagyong ulysses ay nagdulot ng baha at malawakang pinsala. Lahat ng ito ay nangyari habang lumaragasa ang pandemya sa ating bayan. Isang testamento ang nakalipas ng mga buwan na puno ng pagsubok ang adikain ng buong Philippine Red Cross na makatulong sa ating mga kababayan. Isa rin itong patulay na anuman ang ating pagdaanan, basta tayo ay sama-sama, lahat ay kayang-kaya, lahat ay magagawa. Together, we are unstoppable. Nasa puso ng bawat kawani at volunteers ng Philippine Red Cross ang mga kataga. Subukin man tayo ng pagkakataon, hamunin ng panahon, hampasin man ng bagyo, yanigin man ng lindol, pasabugan man ng nag-aagbuhutong bukal. Hindi tayo mapipigilan. Lagi tayo ang una. Lagi tayong handa at lagi tayong naroon kung saan tayo kailangan. Pinadapaman ng talamidad at sakuna. Basta't na nangailangan, hindi mapipigilan ang pagtulong natin sa kanila. Hahanapan natin ng paraan. Walang maiiwanan. Walang makaliligtaan sa pag-abot ng pag-asa. Hindi tayo mapipigilan. Hilarap rin ng Philippine Red Cross ang hamon sa kakulangan ng mga kama sa mga ospital. Naitayo natin ang mga emergency field hospital at emergency tent sa Lung Center of the Philippines at National Kidney and Transplant Institute. Hindi tayo kamitid doon. Agad rin natin itinayo ang mga isolation facility sa mga universidad ng Ateneo, La Salle at UP. Bagamat mabigyan ang laban sa pandemya nito, hindi hindi kami susuko. Pandemya ka nga, pero Philippine Red Cross kami. One of the greatest human quality is that of becoming unstoppable. You become unstoppable by refusing to quit. No matter what happens, our deadly spirits make us unstoppable. Thank you, Kaim. That's all for the Philippine Red Cross response to COVID. Thank you very much, Vaughn. Uh, indeed, the Philippine Red Cross is a benchmark in humanitarian work and disaster preparedness and response globally. So thank you for your work and thank you for the amazing work you are doing for the Filipino people and globally. It's, it's an honor to be associated with you. So I would go and talk about uh, Israel. And uh, just to introduce you to Magen David Adom, we are the Israeli society member of the International Movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And as such, we are auxiliary to our public powers during emergencies and disasters. And in Israel, we are in a situation of disaster during the COVID pandemic. We are the National Blood Service and we are the Israeli Public Emergency Medical Service the uh, EMS. We are a small organization when it comes to uh, staff members with a very large cadre of uh, volunteers, some of them acting as, acting as first responders, uh, driving motorcycles, um, small electrical cars or bicycles to respond or uh, driving with an emergency medical kit in the trunk of their private car. And we are extremely proud to say that we represent all the groups in the Israeli society 
secular Jews, ultra-religious Jews, uh, Muslim, Christian, Druze, and other groups that uh, compose our very, very interesting society, and they are all represented in um, Magen David Adom. When it comes to our um, COVID operation, very similar to the uh, one of the Philippine uh, Red Cross, we uh, took more than 5 million uh, tests uh, of uh, PCR tests that were sent to the laboratories. Magen David Adom does not run uh, its own laboratories. Uh, million and a half rapid antigen tests. Um, we collected uh, more than 23,000 uh, plas convalescent plasma units that were provided to people that uh, were in critical conditions in those days back where vaccines were not available and that was the best treatment available. We uh, put more than uh, one million shots of vaccine into the arms of people. Extremely proud to say that Magen David Adom uh, was tasked by the government to uh, vaccinate all the people, the most vulnerable people uh, living in long-term care facilities we did that um, in the end of 2020. Within three weeks, we vaccinated all those living in long-term care facilities, the elderly people, the people with chronic diseases in, the, in their elderly uh, care facilities. And again, after three weeks for the second dose and now for the third, the third dose, protecting really the most, those who really need that most. And we are, as the EMS, treating and transporting people who are suspected or confirmed as COVID patients with our ambulances to the different hospitals and back to the long-term care uh, facilities, a major operation which is going on. So I would like to pay tribute to our people. So what have we learned throughout uh, this uh, international cooperation? New clinical stuff. My whole life as an ambulance crew member, I've been told that I should not trust the pulse oximeter and the monitor. I should trust the clinical presentation of my patient. And then suddenly, uh, throughout this cooperation, we realized that in COVID, we have patients who clinically look very well their saturation is horrible and they will crash. They will crash in minutes. We call it the silent hypoxia phenomenon. Something that saved many lives in Israel because the moment we were able to alert our staff members about staff and volunteers dealing with patients about this phenomena, they could advise people that did not want to go to the hospital that they are in a life-threatening condition. And I can tell you countless uh, stories about these cases that people were like, but I'm okay. And really they got to the hospital and were saved on minute 90 or sometime 95. And that's really something that we were able to bring to our volunteers and staff very early before many others were aware of it, just because we heard about it from our colleagues in Italy, our colleagues in Spain who were seeing this phenomenon. Um, 
we were inviting the procedure as we were flying along the pandemic. We, uh, with the better, the best contingency plan that we had, we didn't imagine the extent, the complexity of the situation. So for us, these webinars were the fora where we could discuss, uh, challenge, and in many cases, reaffirm our uh, thoughts or the way we were doing things. And we could go to uh, our management and say, maybe it is not the best. But this is the way it is being done also uh, in uh, other countries like in, uh, the, in Italy, like in Spain, where uh, they were at the highest point of uh, patients being uh, treated. And um, by doing that, at least we were doing the same things. At the end, we realized that they were the right things but it's much better uh, challenging yourself with ideas from other countries than uh, just it's my own brains who brings that. And in those moments of our sense uncertainty, this was one of the key issues for us. Issues on supply chain, and it's not just medical supply chain. We are all talking about medical supply chain, about PPE. Uh, we had issues with computers that uh, we didn't have spare parts spare parts just because there were no international flights and other issues that we could bring early enough so we could prepare ourselves and make contingencies and doing a real preparedness is thinking in a holistic way not just about a current issue like uh, my medical supplies ideas about caring uh, for our personnel that uh, was over and over mentioned again they are the heroes they are the ones who did the job and we really had to think about their well-being. And through these series of webinars, we got many positive, incredible ideas uh, on what can we do with them. With them. Um, Professor De La Corte spoke about the infodemic, about the misinformation, about creating trust. Uh, it, we, no one had the solution, but many people had very good ideas about concrete things that could be done that we implemented and really helped us to create this trust with our volunteers, with our staff, with our communities that we are serving. And at the end of the day, they are why we are doing what we are doing. New technologies were brought in about disinfection, about personal protective equipment. All those were so uh, important and some of them were implemented in Magenda Vida Dome throughout the pandemic itself. And we thought it's over and we thought it's over uh, June 2020 after the first wave. And then we had the second, the third, and now we are getting out of the fourth, praying to God that we will not see the fifth. But learning is key for us. And we, it's our obligation to learn one from the other, from one event to the next, to be better prepared. And what we realized is that in order to be prepared, only together we are stronger. For us, this is the key. And being part of this network, of the No Fear Network, for us is being stronger. So I would thank you for listening to Magenda Vida Non presentation. And I would share with you two emblematic uh, images from um, the pandemic one at the bottom is of a crew uh, working regularly in Beersheba station in the south of Israel, an ultra-religious Jew with an ultra-religious Muslim. They are the team every morning they, and they ask their dispatcher to allow them for a short morning prayer. Uh, the Israeli, the Jewish guy is uh, praying to Jerusalem, so it's to the north, the Muslim to the south both Israelis and when they are asked what are they praying for, the answer is uh, for this pandemic to go away. It looks like it will stay with us, unfortunately. And on the top, uh, you would see uh, the municipality of Jerusalem lightening the walls of the old city of Jerusalem with a statement, Jerusalem salutes Magen David Adom in recognition of the work that our volunteers and staff did during this pandemic. So uh, I please uh, the editor cut us here and uh, we go back 
here. And without further ado, I would hand over to the moderator of our panel, Itamar, please. Thank you, Chaim, and thanks uh, to all the speakers in this very interesting webinar. I think uh, all of your presentation were enlightening and uh, it is impressive to see how organizations uh, share knowledge. And I have several questions for you. I would like to start with Paloma. Uh, my first, my question to you, if you don't mind, is, uh, I mean, we mentioned, all of you mentioned the, the knowledge sharing between the organizations. And I wanted to know um, if you can share with us what was your most uh, important uh, lesson learned that, uh, that you picked up uh, from others uh, during this uh, COVID uh, pandemic? Well, obviously the, the experience of other organizations and countries that uh, had an earlier breakout was crucial to us because then we had lots of, of infected people uh, and we, we learned uh, a lot from managing the pandemia, from isolation, from EMS hospital coordination, PPEs, um, lack of stock, uh, everything. So it was, uh, for us, it was crucial, this, this experience of the others. Uh, it also boosts the collaboration between the, the other organizations and what's very important. And uh, sharing uh, our knowledge has been a critical element for us uh, uh, of a successful management, management sorry, efforts. Um, in that moment, it was more important than uh, searching from the literature, for medical literature, in the internet, in the uh, whatever, uh, our sharing, I think it was uh, the best thing we could do for, for learning from each other. So it, it was very important for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paloma, for these examples. Um, uh, my next question will, will be to uh, Professor De La Corte. Um, and my question to you as a project uh, coordinator who runs the project and has uh, um, um, relations with different organizations, uh, how difficult uh, was it or uh, what uh, level of cooperation did you receive from the different uh, partners in the project uh, when it comes to knowledge sharing? Was it difficult to motivate uh, them to, to share the knowledge? Um, what did you do to improve uh, knowledge sharing within the project between the, the partners? Yeah, uh, in fact, there, there was no troubles to do that you know, because uh, the attention of uh, different partners to what was uh, at the very beginning uh, fully unknown, it was, uh, seen, seen, it was perceived at least as a, as a great opportunity to improve their own knowledge. And, and so we had no problems since the very starting uh, of our activities uh, dedicated to COVID-19 pandemia. Uh, and people uh, participate as uh, auditors in, uh, at the beginning, but uh, immediately later, they propose topics. They uh, ask to, uh, to have information. And, you know, I, I remember that, uh, as, I told, as I told before, uh, Italy was, uh, especially the northern part of Italy, was uh, it at the very beginning. So we were at that time the 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 who were the first experience. I don't want to say the most experienced, but the first that were experienced to exposition of COVID nineteen, and so there were a need uh, for a lot of people to ask us information, to ask us the way we reacted, the, to ask us uh, how problems could be for, could be solved. This is not. I don't want to say that we were ambassador of, uh, of reaction, but uh, in fact, uh, because um, so many people made it probably much better than we do, than we did. But uh, for sure, I can assure you that there were a lot of interest from people a, either in, uh, in the, in the uh, in, uh, no fear uh, participant, but also outside. Of that, there was a great interest uh, in uh, in uh, to join to the network and to improve uh, what the, uh, the their knowledges were. 
And uh, so I, I'm personally, I'm, I'm very satisfied uh, about that. And I, I would like to thank uh, also all the uh, uh, members uh, of the managing board, but also the members of all the consortium that were absolutely immediate, immediately active in, uh, in giving the support to uh, the uh, to increasing to increase the uh, the, 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 the the panorama uh, of the no fear and so I I think that it was a very 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 interesting and productive work that we have done in our project so thank you to all the practitioners to all the suppliers to all the academicians to all the people who work uh, inside our project because they very they made a very good work and also to all the people who participated just because they were interested in uh, in what we were producing yes thank you thank you uh, professor de la Cote. and i think you said you're satisfied and it is very satisfying to hear what you just said that uh, it was easy to to have the cooperation between the the partners and then that this uh, knowledge sharing was achieved uh, quite easily thank you for that uh, Vaughn, I have one question for you too. Um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, different uh, new roles that your uh, national society organization um, received or took um, during, the, during the pandemic. Uh, you mentioned the uh, samples, vaccinations, uh, the, the uh, plasma uh, from uh, recovered uh, patients. And my question is how did the organization Learn the new these new ro roles. What what uh, um, uh, means did you have to achieve knowledge to prefer, perform sorry those uh, uh, new um, tasks? Yes, thank you. Actually, it's very difficult for for the Philippine Red Cross to start whatever endeavor that we took uh, from 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 the past years. But we need to make sure that we carry our load. The Philippine Red Cross carry its load in supporting to the battle of the COVID-19. So in, in response to what we did to make sure that we can carry our load and contribute to the fight against COVID, of course, we are referring to other countries uh, like MDA uh, for the guidance and, and, and protocols that we need to make sure to, to have in our responses. We also partner with uh, a, a university in Illinois in the U.S. in uh, uh, upgrading our uh, molecular laboratory in, in not only doing a saliva swabbing or swabbing for, for COVID-19, but also for saliva collection to, to be tested for RT-PCR. So a lot of coming from our external partners, uh, friends, are really a vital had the vital role in our efforts to fight against the pandemic. Uh, these are are very uh, vital because as within the country, we don't have that kind of information or study uh, within within us. So we need to extend our research, extend our uh, collaboration with other stakeholders outside the country to make sure that it will be. Uh, a local practice and response of the Philippine Red Cross and also for the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think from, for many, it was uh, new experiences. Uh, so, so again, the, the knowledge sharing between different countries or different uh, sectors, organization was crucial. Um, Chaim, my final question uh, for you is a difficult one. Uh, we mentioned the uh, knowledge sharing and the, the benefits of it, but maybe there are some uh, challenges within uh, knowledge, share, knowledge sharing uh, that you can uh, share with us now. Uh, I would say uh, the most important issue as in many other aspects of COVID-19 is about trust. Um, Knowledge sharing is not just about sharing your success stories. It's also about sharing your uh, challenges, the issues you, that you faced, and sometimes uh, your failures. And uh, you, you learn as much as um, 
You learn from success stories, also from the failures. But you have to trust the people that you are uh, sharing with that uh, it will be used in, in the right way. And uh, if, if someone says, uh, and, and we saw it during the pandemic, uh, we had to decide uh, which patients are we going to ventilate uh, because we did not have enough ventilators. Um, it, it's an extremely important point in your preparedness, in, in the way that you are thinking about what happens if, and, and this is the key question that you ask when you are preparing. Uh, but you, you need to trust that it's used this way and it will not become tomorrow a headline in uh, all the newspapers uh, in, in your country, country X or service X or hospital X are letting patients die because they don't have enough ventilators. And uh, I think that the great advantage that we had in No Fear Project was this level of trust among the partners uh, that allowed us really to discuss tough issues, uh, understanding that some countries are already facing them, other countries might be facing them in the future, and uh, the only way we can prepare is discussing them and uh, keeping that in a way that we are professionals and professionals um, appreciate honesty. And we don't try just to hide behind our success stories and we are not there sharing uh, because uh, saying how wonderful I am is not sharing. It's uh, a very small part portion, and sometimes you learn more from the from the issues. So I'm uh, I would say we are privileged to be part of this network that was really honest and open. And uh, I know that some colleagues uh, did not sleep enough at night preparing the presentation for us, and we admire them uh, for that. So thank you very much. Indeed. So, so having those networks with trusts and with uh, organizations and, and people that you know is a crucial part of this uh, of this knowledge sharing that supported so well and uh, so many during these uh, new uh, challenges brought by the COVID nineteen pandemic. Thank you very much uh, uh, to all the speakers for, for your uh, uh, answers. Um, Chaim, if you want to close the call. Yeah, I would just say that. Uh... The word on the slide is hope, and hope uh, comes with the vaccines. So I, I personally would uh, use this opportunity to ask everyone who can get the vaccine, please do that. That's the, our way out of this unique, challenging situation is by getting the vaccine. This is our hope, and I will hand over to Professor Placorte to conclude uh, this webinar. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Haim. I'm uh, really satisfied of it. Uh, we, we, I think we have succeeded to, to give a, a real global uh, a, a presentation because uh, there, there were people from all the continents and uh, with the same problem, you know. So the way that uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, acted in a, in a may, maybe in a in a good way was uh, to implement the networking and to implement the exchange of ideas, uh, implement the exchange of procedures to improve our quality of work and to give us uh, the the perception that we all in all the continents we are working together in a global environment. We are not alone, and we need to implement the perception that we can get anything for everybody. So thank you very much for having organized this, uh, this conference. Uh, I'm really sure that uh, it uh, will give a, a good, uh, that it, it has given a good output and I'm also sure that it will be useful for anybody who will be hearing to that. So thank you very much again for having attended this session and uh, for having given your presentation in the, as uh, witnesses of your uh, personal work, uh, I think that it, it was a very productive se se seminar. So I'm very, very happy about that. Thank you very much to every one of you.